dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Sister Natalia. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to him forever. You just did this like swish with your head. I don't know how to, as you said, glory to Jesus Christ. It was like. It's it's an attitude thing. I'm, I'm, if I had hair, I'd be swishing it behind my back <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an act of attitude, like with my hand, but I don't need my hand. I just rake my head back to the right and my hair all goes flowing over my shoulders. Rake my head back? And Is that it? It's just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you, just got, you just got to run with these things. Like if you think that's a thing, then the listeners will too. But as soon as you call me out on these things, it's like, oh yeah, that that's 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 utterly ridiculous. That's not even a word. And like if you would just said, oh, that great use of a very esoteric vocabulary, Father Michael. I don't know what esoteric is. Listeners means. would be like, oh man, he is so smart. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think that's a thing. What, what's what I am thinking of? Not rake. Um, I don't know. Swish. I don't know. You said rake your swish head back. your hair. I don't know. I, 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 you, I, you saw me do it. It's kind of like <laughs> not anything like I'm, a rake. Maybe, maybe I'm thinking of like. It, it is, I mean, imagine like <laughs> like we got to move on. I'm, I'm, this is totally a stretch here. I'm trying to find some way of justifying this, and it's not oh, going to work. Move on. Move on. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to say what it is because it was it was inappropriate. But there was a there was a video I saw on social media recently where the the podcast co host like it's just like a video podcast and the podcast co host always starts the podcast by making it sound like they were continuing a previous conversation when someone just hit record. And Father Nathan and I used to do this a little bit on on Catholic stuff. Those of you who are listening who know Catholic stuff will know that I try to get I try to get Father Nathan laughing or something before I hit record because he can't see when I hit record. Oh, you've done that to so me. So he and I so will be just times. talking and talking. Well, yeah, but you can see because of what we use, uh-huh. you can see when I hit record. Yeah. But Father Nathan couldn't. So we'd literally be going and going like we'd go to confession and sometimes I'd I, I would like wait till the confession is over, then I just hit record, <laughs> and then we'd and then we'd start praying, or I so people would get the prayer or whatever, and until I don't think he even listened to the podcast, so he literally had no idea when I would start recording. That's really funny. we would just start talking, or he'd go like, "Are you recording?" I'd be like, yeah, "I'm actually recording for the past five minutes." But after a while, he would catch on and kind of know when it started. But that's kind of how this podcast was. But it wasn't really in the middle of a conversation. One of the hosts would just like he'd hit record and then he would start saying something that would just be hilarious, like referring to the other guy. The one I watched, he just said, you know, you can't say, and then he said this horribly offensive thing. You can't say that. Like, like, like that. that's offensive. That's so politically incorrect. The guy had not just said that, but he acted like the guy had just um, said that, you yeah. know, in order to make people think he had said it. But so starting with glory to Jesus Christ is a very Byzantine thing to do, but, but, um, Every once in a while, I might uh, no. I might come in with that if I can if I can no. change how clever I am. <laughs> God, God, give me cleverness, Lord, make me funny, and and let me let it just let it just flow from me so that I can. Lord, make me funny so podcasts. that I can start the podcast with myself instead of giving glory to you. By, <laughs> <laughs> That's what you just prayed. We'll get we'll get a we'll get around to glorifying God. It's just it's just oh, no. a, a little a little bit of <laughs> You're humor. You're such first. a bad influence. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to scandalize people right now. I know. Uh, all right. Well, I um I d- I wrote this the topic of my podcast. Wait, I'm drinking hot chocolate. Um, On Friday again. Th- is it is it dairy? Yes. Because we are recording during cheese fair. Yeah. Listen, this is something I don't understand and I've never understood. So we're in cheese fair week, right? This is one of the pre-Lenten yes. weeks. And the point yes. of it originally is like eat up all the dairy that's in your house so that um, – because you're not going to be eating dairy during the Great Fast and so you don't want it to go bad or to be wasteful or whatever. Um, last right. week was meat fair – so the reason for yeah. that was eat all the meat in your house so it doesn't go bad. <clears throat> so we kind of gradually ease into the fast. So we give up meat a week before we give up dairy, right? So we haven't been eating meat this week, theoretically. So at our monastery, we haven't because um, we practice the full fast. 
But here's what I don't you're understand. You're crazy holy. Um, that is yes. not what I said. It's because we are not holy and we <laughs> need it. Um, Beth, hashtag crazy holy. Okay. Um, so <laughs> here's what I've never understood. And are you laughing at your hashtag right now? Or is something you just like read on your phone? And I'm laughing at your reaction. Okay. Like I don't... Oftentimes I, 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 I say things, they're not actually funny, but they invoke <laughs> a funny reaction from you. So it's not like, it's not like what I say that's funny, but I, but I just, I, I know that it's going to get a reaction that's going to make me laugh. Okay. So anyway, that's. So I'm really bothered by this inconsistency uh, and Go always ahead. have been. So for Meat Fair, we eat lots of meat all week. Right, but we still fast from meat yes. on Wednesday and Friday. Okay. And then cheese fair. That's the tradition. We the unwashed, unholy only do it on Friday. And then cheese what? We unholy. We we ju- we only fast from meat on Friday. Okay. During meat fair, but still, you do fast from meat on Friday, even though it's meat fair. Yes. Cheese fair. Yes. You eat dairy all week. Even Wednesday and Friday. What's up with that? Because da- dairy is only a great fast thing or only a fasting thing. It's, we, don't, we don't fast from dairy during the normal part of the year where we do fast from meat during the normal part of the year. Well, we fast from dairy during the, on Wednesdays and Fridays during the rest of the year. So that logic See, doesn't what I mean. apply. You guys are just, it doesn't apply in your monastery, but it does apply for those of us in the world. And I'm guessing whoever made up that rule is is taking the more ordinary, worldly understanding. Mm. We're not worldly. That's the wrong word. The way the way that that we Maybe huddled unwashed right out here in the world. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. The worldly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll take it. I'll take it. Don't hope that the bishops start listening. <laughs> <laughs> or they'd be giving into the worldly ways. Oh, no. I just I just finished our um our post our our uh Lenten post like uh, sending more, the bulletin tomorrow is going to uh. have the regulations for Lenten fast. Mm-hmm. And I just, all I did was cut and paste what's in our Tipicon, our like guidebook mm-hmm. for the year, but then I did the whole Father Michael translation because there's a lot of esoteric language in there that's kind of you know, the word mitigation, do people know what mitigation means? They know what full mitigation means, they know what partial mitigation means, they know what strict fast means as opposed to, you know, other things. So, or, uh, or mitigation on these days from wine and oil. So I just posted the whole thing and then I gave my little, my little translation, which I should probably send to the media team to maybe post on here just because so people can see yeah. like what, what our Byzantine regulations are. We have a lot of Roman Catholic listeners that may want to, may, I might, we might even just post it. I'll, I'll see if the media team can post it like this weekend. That's a good idea. Um, you used esoteric twice in this podcast already and we're only eight minutes in. Yes. That's very impressive. I thank you. You're welcome. Do you know what it means, sister? No, I said that at the beginning. The first time you said it, oh, I said, I don't know what esoteric a, means. It's a, a age of uh, dinosaurs between... You are the, the worst. Meso, <laughs> mesoteric and the... Uh, the oh, dinoteric okay. or whatever whatever <laughs> those ages are. It just means it means like um only known to a select group. Okay. Like exclusive. It's like it's like only used by certain people in a certain subculture. Yeah, exclusive. I like that. But it's not exclusive makes it sound like we're hiding it from people. Mm-hmm. We're not I mean th- this is language. It's just you're not going to understand it unless you unless you are in the world of of Byzantine fasting. That makes sense. Or even I guess just even Christian fasting with mitigations and and what that means and the difference between fasting and abstinence. And there's actually a difference. You know, we in the, we in the East use fasting for everything, whereas in the West, uh, fasting means not eating and abstaining means not eating certain things. So like on uh, in the oh. West on Good Friday, you, you fast by eating less food, but you also abstain from meat. Mm-hmm. And we, we just don't really, we, 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 we don't have that, uh, since most, I know you, you in the monastery do it differently, but here, here in the world, I don't think, I don't think lay people have actually fasted in the East for, uh, as far as like, as, as, as a group for a time, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are some Orthodox who would be listening to this and go, we do it all the time. But like, 
Um, I know you and your monastery sister, right? On on days, Wednesdays and Fridays, you don't eat anything until after presanctified, correct? Correct. As yeah. a general rule, um, the monastery. That's just because okay. we don't we don't we fast until the Eucharist whenever we have the Eucharist. So, so okay. it's not even just because uh, it's presanctified. Okay. It's like if we have divine liturgy one day and the priest can't come until two o'clock, then we don't eat until after mm. liturgy. Oh, I see. So for our listeners, Presanctified Divine Liturgy is, is uh, refers to a Vespers and communion service that we celebrate on Wednesdays and Fridays during the Great Fast because Monday through Friday, we do not celebrate the anaphora. We don't celebrate the consecration because that is a participation in Christ's resurrection. So Monday through Friday, we generally only hear Old Testament because the Old Testament prepared for the coming of the Messiah. So we're preparing for the coming of Pascha or Easter. Um, so, but because there is an understanding that we need the Eucharist to sustain us, especially in the time of the great fast when the devil's so active. Um, therefore, we receive the Eucharist on Wednesdays and Fridays evening without a consecration. So we, the, the anaphora is celebrated and the bread and wine are consecrated in the body blood of Christ on Sundays. It's then kept on the altar and then distributed on Wednesdays and Fridays for this per sanctified divine liturgy. Um, and so, but it's that, that's really, as far as I know, other than like vigils of major feasts, it's the only time when the Eucharist is prescribed to be done in the afternoon or evening. Mm. Um, you know, for certain vigils like Christmas and Pascha, there's a vigil liturgy that's prescribed, um, but per sanctifies are actually prescribed to be done in the evening. Yes, yes, especially since it's in the great fast, um, there's, you, you normally kind of celebrate it the next day in a sense. So there's a vigil. Um, what was it? How many years ago was it crazy that it, it, it landed on Good Friday? Oh, that was like two, and then you, two or three you know, years ago. It was, that was the uh, most the, the insane yeah. liturgical. Oh man, that was crazy. Thank God for liturgists and typicons because I mean, there's yes. no way that it's, it's like, it's like a, it's like someone, um, I, I've been kind of venting to some of my actor friends here in LA, but like for, as a priest, doing my taxes my uh, myself would would take so much esoteric knowledge to use that word again it would take so much like interior knowledge of the ways of the tax code american tax code and actually for actors uh, I'll say, I won't I won't say like not not big name actors but the kind of actors that don't have a second or third job um it's the same thing with health insurance and with like for sag after um screen actors guild you don't you, unless I think you make $35,000 a year, you don't get health insurance from SAG. But if you make that much or more, you do. But of course, year to year, and during COVID, very few actors made that much money. But then you have other taxes and other things for your other jobs that all come together. So it's really hard to do your own taxes if you're in a in various fields like this. And I imagine it's the same for a nun. Um, I don't do taxes because I don't have any. Render income. under Caesar, sister. Render unto Caesar. Caesar ain't giving me nothing. I'm just, I'm just like throwing out random Bible quotes here <laughs> <laughs> that, that don't really apply that much. <laughs> anyway, um, what did I get into this? Because oh, oh we were talking I was about talking we about the fact that I was drinking hot chocolate on Friday because that was exciting. Yeah. Um, but now we can talk you about know, your. Topic. You could always just not drink hot cocoa on Friday if the if this if this structure confuses you so much. No, obviously I'm excited about it. I just think, I just don't like the inconsistency. (laughs) Oh, that's right. Um, So that's actually a a pretty good um, transition. Are we talking about all the things Um, that bother sisters? I I want, no, like uh, you are the, I'm going to call you when you die and go to heaven. I'm going to call you um, Mother Natalia, the consistency lover. (laughs) Because you know how many saints we have that are named kind of things like, like that. Saint John the they're, they're, they're named, saint, yeah, a, a yes, or one of my favorites, Saint Maximus the Hut Burner. Mm-hmm. Where would, <laughs> we celebrated him a while we ago. We just had one the other day, the the something eater, and it was like the thing that That's, he ate was. This sim- is my <gasps> topic. No. Yes, That's so funny. the auric eater. The auric eater, yes. The auric eater, <laughs> yes. So, so, do you know funny. what auric is, it's sister? It's a type of mushroom or something. Or it's, no, no, no. It's similar. It's similar to spinach. 
It's similar to spinach. Yes, Because exactly. we read this in, we read this in the prologue the other night and we were all just like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes, the hut dweller, the hut burner, John the faster, Maximus the hut burner. I love Maximus the hut burner, by the way, if you want to look him up, he was on Mount Athos and he would, he kind of had it. Many many monastics have idiosyncrasies, uh, present company included, <laughs> and um, and the uh, and he would he would build a hut like on Mount Athos. He'd build it somewhere, and then he'd burn it, and then go build one somewhere else. And a lot of times, I think in in Eastern spirituality, Byzantine spirituality, you have a lot of these. They, they 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 need to separate themselves from the norm. In other words, we get too consistent, sister. So in other <laughs> words, jo, uh, Max was the hut burner probably loved consistency sister and he probably loved you know the same the functioning of the day and the discipline sister and he probably loved kind of doing the same thing sister why is, so he why would he would he would build these become shaming me <laughs> <laughs> so he would build huts and to live in it and but then i think once he got kind of restful and, and started liking that hut in that location he'd hmm. burn it as like a sign of of getting rid of the I, again, this is not in his hagiography. This is not in his story, but 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 it's. I imagine that's that's part of it. At least that's I think the holy thing to do. So then he would build another one somewhere else and burn it and go. So they called him Maximus the Hut Burner. It's like the detachment um, of like the the saints who would um, spend all day weaving baskets and then at the end of the day burn all of the work that they've done. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Exactly. There's kind of a. It, it's a. It's an ascetical practice. It's a separation from the, the um, what's the phrase I'm thinking of, causes and effects. You know, I do this and therefore I deserve mm, this. Mm-hmm. You know, the, how many times do modern Christians think that? I do this, therefore God, I deserve this. We, 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 we're like Adam and Eve. We want to grasp from the tree the knowledge of good and evil to define for myself what is good, what is evil, to grind for myself, what the consequences of my actions are, to define these things for myself. And so there are these practices I like that where you know you build a basket all day and then 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 burn it. So in other words, you're you're getting used to the fact that I might put a lot of effort into one thing that I think the outcome should be this, um, and then is when it's not, then I get all disappointed and start yelling at God. You know, Lord, I, you know, I I fasted all day. Why aren't I happy? You know, it's it's like. <laughs> That's not how God works. That's not how the Christian life works. And these monastics that were so good at at doing little things to remind themselves that we don't define the fruits or the the consequences of what we do, you know. And it can be very freeing to say, I'm gonna put this effort in. What was the saint who his spiritual father asked him to plant a stick? I think we talked about this. Plant a stick in the ground, stick a stick um, in the ground and water every was, day. That was like John, walk some miles. I think that was John the dwarf. John the stick planter? Oh. Wasn't that John the dwarf? Okay. Probably. You know these things better I than know. I do. Um, so yeah, it's like, like stick, stick a stick in the ground and water every day. He had to like walk, carry water out to water a stick. And then like right at the end of his life, God actually let the stick blossom, which is of course You know miracle. what's interesting? Someone just recently, um, a priest friend of mine was just telling me, he listens to the podcast. Um, and he was saying that there's a, at least one saint in the West who has the same story. It was, it was something, I'm not going to get it right. So forgive me, everyone. I think it's John the little person. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one was funny. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, no, it was a, it was a woman. Um, and she... Joan. <laughs> she <laughs> she um entered a convent or something and the superior the formation directress or something like that um told her that she was to um same thing like water this stick for um for however long and and she was told this was part of the formation, I think, but like no one else was made to do this. So they all think that she's a crazy person mm. because she's just watering this uh, stick. They don't know that she oh, is doing it out of obedience. And um, and then it ends up growing into a vine that produces grapes. And this convent still exists and that grapevine still exists. And each year they use some of the grapes from that vine to maybe make wine that they give to the Pope or something like that or to the bishop. And um, mm. if, this is maybe in Italy somewhere. I don't know. And um, and then each each of the nuns there gets like 
10 grapes or something like that. That's all they have enough for. But Wow. That's cool. I like yeah. that because it continues to sustain and obviously the story gets passed on and, and what a beautiful story so. it is. So, so what happened was there was one day, so now in my parish, um, and by the way, uh, I think we're going to start uh, live streaming this on Facebook. So if any listeners are on Facebook and you want to see us do this, um, almost every morning here in the parish at 7.30 a.m. Pacific, we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be live streaming our morning prayer. Mm. And so that we're going to, it begins, so it begins with like 10 minutes of Jesus prayer, silent Jesus prayer time. So we probably will not live stream that because that'd be pretty boring. Um, but we'll start live streaming. That's kind of offensive um, because when the, we live stream Matins and Vespers, we include the Jesus prayer. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of why. I, why I didn't, Seriously, I, I'm totally kidding. I, I, in all honesty, and I don't mean to be offensive. I have never watched your. <laughs> <laughs> I've never watched well, your you morning for to, which is probably even more it. offensive. But no, <laughs> right? Yeah, I yeah. think I think so, you should include the Jesus prayer part because then people can be praying the Jesus prayer with you too. Oh, you're probably right. Fine, okay. fine. I'll think about it. I'll pray about it. Thanks. Um. The, uh, so anyway, but now we're, also, we're gonna start live streaming and then we read the Synaxarian. So we read the story of the saints of the day and then we go right into Matins. It's again, 7.30 a.m. on our, our uh, Proto-Cathedral of St. Mary or Byzantine Catholic Proto-Cathedral of St. Mary, I think is the Facebook page. Anyway, um, you look us up, it shows uh, our beautiful double domed church on the front of it. I think, I think it's, if you search for it on Facebook, it's, it's at Proto-Cathedral S.O. for Sherman Oaks at Proto-Cathedral S.O to find our uh, our parish. Anyway, we, so we do this. So when I read this, it's it's great because I don't know, one of the reasons we do these episodes is because a lot of people don't know our Byzantine saints, even Byzantine Catholic people don't know our Byzantine saints. So this is kind of a Saint of the Day episode. Um, but there was a, the one on February 10th, was it? You'll remember both of these sister. And you'll probably know them because one of the saints was one of the names. Is this, am I allowed to say yeah. this? Do we need to edit this out, do we? Okay, Our so- Olympus. So- Yes, yes. So, so sister gave me an immense blessing in my life as a mm-hmm. celibate by asking me to submit the three names um, that we would submit to mother that she chose one of or none of um, to to make her religious name. So as, as sister said, you know, I will never be able to name a child, of course, because I'm not a biological father, um, but uh, but I will but now I am able to name somebody. So I, I gave her three different names. One of them was, was to be named after Nathaniel um, because he was with that guy. Another one was to be named after this saint, um, St. Charolampus. How do you pronounce it? Charolampus? Yeah. Charolampus? Because the- Charolampus. Because, yeah, I can't say that. So I just say Charolampus, but um, because- It's C-H-A-R-A-L-A-M-P-U-S in yes. English. Yes. Um, yeah. The reason I say Carlumpus is because <clears throat> your reasoning for giving it to me is because um, the Greek word for joy is kara. Um, and okay. the Greek um, doesn't have the ch sound, right? Greek? I don't, I don't think know. so. So yeah. I can't think of, I I can't think of what Greek letter probably. that would be. So... Um, so I think it's Carlumpus. Carlumpus. Yeah. And maybe, maybe that's where the girl's name Cara comes from. I know some Caras. Mm-hmm. That might we have a Cara coming on Pustinia tonight. That's so um, crazy. Well, her, it might how be how pronounced Cara. I don't know. Cara? Cara. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, actually I'm, t- I'm thinking maybe my Cara is Cara as well. Anyway, <laughs> that might be the same yeah. root though. It might be the same name. So anyway, uh, this was February 10th, which was two days ago. So that was Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so February 10th, uh, two, and both the saints of the day from the prologue of Ochrid, um, we'll reference that on the, in the notes, um, Beth, you listening? Um, uh, the, uh, so both, both saints kind of made me smile and made me, made me, uh, think. Um, so I figured we'd do this for a, a saint of the day podcast. So, um, anyway, so Carolampus means, uh, something like glowing with joy, so those of you who listened a while, you know that that would be a good, that'd be a good saint for a sister Aww, to tell you as well. So sweet. Even though, because like you can't even see your face, but that's not <laughs> about it. Of course, it, it's, it's, you can't even see your smile in other words, but, but you can, it is, um, it is a, a personality thing. So glowing with joy. So Carl Lampus, um, so I will read his story that we can discuss it if you will. 
um, and then the, the, then afterwards is Prochorus the Oric Eater. <laughs> um, and both have pretty cool stories. And by the way, um, I, I know one of the one of the things about we, that we as in, we Christians like doing with saints that we like is naming our children after them. Um, so I know that you know if, if you want to find ways of doing Prochorus or Carolampus in uh, you can do middle names maybe or uh, or just take part of it or we have a shout out again to the Jun- Juntas. Mm-hmm. Juntas. <laughs> the Juntas, um, who always, as we've mentioned before, make make very creative names their children out of out of saints' names or saints' stories, which I think is beautiful. Mm-hmm. So if you want any help with that, for Car Lampus look us up, ask us to help. For Car Lampus, I had submitted either Cara or Carlampia. Mm-hmm. Which the mm. nuns It does sound better in the in the feminine. So the nuns to no end, like they still tease me about this because they were, they're all like, oh, we wish you had that so we could call you Sister Lumpy. Um, <laughs> so Mother Gabriella opened the prologue or whoever it was opened the prologue the other day and Mother Gabriella is just like, Sister Lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's you know what's really funny is that I, I've said, I've been here over a year now, year almost a year and a half, and I don't have any nicknames. Uh-huh. And there's been very l- few times, I think we might have talked about this, very little, um, when I move somewhere, I get a nickname pretty quickly. And so those of you who listen, used to listen to Catholic stuff know, you know, Olo, Frollo, Flolo, Olaf, all the different nicknames I had in the Companions of Christ. But here I don't have any nicknames. And yet Father Nathan's four, five-year-old daughter seems to have given me a nickname that I'm really hoping does not catch on. And she's just like in her innocence. <laughs> and it's because I think she used to see me wearing this same gray hoodie all the time because I have this gray hoodie I love. And so I'll, I'll wear it around a lot. And then whenever she'd like run up and give me a hug, she would always go, squishy. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm not wearing the hoodie anymore. And she's squishy. <laughs> Are you sure? Like, oh are you sure gosh. she was referencing the hoodie? I I was really hoping she was, <laughs> but then, like I said to her in front of her dad, I was like, um, I really don't want this to catch on as a nickname. And and then she like she grabs my arm, like where there's no there's no shirt, and, like just on my bare arm. She's like squishy. <laughs> oh no, that's the best. So anyway. Oh man, uh, that's I don't want the to be best. Squish or father squish or something like that. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I should be saying this out loud because that's that's how these things start. Anyway. Um, oh, if this starts, it is of your own doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, sorry, my my getting much a bunch of texts here. I need to get them, get rid of them. Okay. So February tenth, um, the Hieromartyr Charolampus, uh, Carolampus. We'll say. I, I don't want. I want to use your version. But I might, I might get it wrong at because I always call him Carolampus. So Carolampus, this great saint, Carolampus, was a bishop in Magnesia who suffered for Christ in his 113th year. When a terrible persecution began during the reign of Emperor Septimus Severus, the elder, the elderly Carolampus, did not hide from the persecutors, but instead he freely and openly preached the Christian faith. He endured all tortures as though he were in someone else's body. When they skinned him alive, the forgiving elders said to the emperor's soldiers, Thank you, my brethren, for this scri- for in scraping my old body, you renew my spirit for the new eternal life. He worked many miracles and converted many to the faith. Even the emperor's daughter, Galena, abandoned the idolatry of her father and became a Christian. Condemned to death and brought to the place of execution, St. Carlampus raised his hands to heaven and prayed to God for all people that God would grant them bodily health and spiritual salvation and that he would multiply their fruit of the earth. He said, O Lord, thou knowest that men are flesh and blood, forgive them their sins and pour out thy grace on all. After prayer, this holy elder gave up his soul to God before the executioner lowered the sword on his neck. He suffered in the year 202 AD. The emperor's daughter, Galena, removed his body and honorably buried it. So obviously I love, I love the name, um, you know, glowing with joy. uh, But 
there, there's a couple things here that I love because he was old. He was 113 years old. Mm-hmm. And so there's, you know, normally, and I've, I've preached this and I, and I think this, that, that when we get old, our body just is not what it was <laughs> before where we become, you know, we're not as, you know, ex- objectively good looking. Of course, old people are kind of cute in their, in their, in their wrinkliness, but, um, but they're, 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 they're not as kind of attractive as, as youth, right? There's something objectively attractive about youth. Um, and then there's also something where, you know, I think a point of holiness is kind of saying as you get older, hopefully you're becoming holier and therefore you don't need your body as much. Like you, you don't need the, the goods of the body. You don't need the joys of having a healthy body, being able to run around and, and attract people. And, you know, all, and even your brain starts to go, so you're not as charming, you're not as funny and all these things start to fade. So, um, but, but, um, St. Carl Lampus was so insistent in his prayer that he kind of acknowledges the fact that we have bodies. And mm-hmm. and then two things stuck out at me. One was that he prayed for health of body. Like I, 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 you, you see very few saints actually praying for health of body. We, we do it in the church, of course, but there's something about, especially a man in old age and especially the monastics kind of say, you know, let the body wither away. You know, we, we don't need this body. Like our bodies are definitely part of us, but but it needs to be honed and, and, and cared for and, and, you know, uh, made sure that the brain is master of the body, not the body master of the brain. And so, but it, I just love the fact that even in in his withered old body, he still prayed for health of body and soul for those who were killing him. Mm-hmm. You know, he asked that they pr- be forgiven. He was pretty much saying, any the the reason they're killing me and the reason why anybody sins is because of selfishness. It, it, it's it's a putting putting things first, namely our own pleasure um, and our own passions above above what is of God. Um, so he he prayed for his persecutors. He prayed for those who were killing him. And yet at the same time, he was asking when they were literally torturing him by scraping the skin off his body. I know this is probably a, a, a PG um, podcast, but anyway, um, as they're doing this, he, he said, thank you for removing the the <laughs> flesh that, that, that can be so leaning towards sin so that the spirit may be revealed. Um, and then at the end, I love the fact that that he, at 113 years old, he actually died right before the executioner mm-hmm. dropped the sword. Yeah. So like he wasn't, he wasn't. I mean, we call him a martyr, and we we call even in the church we call those who are martyr who died because of if you if you died because of torture, you're a martyr. In other words, if you would not have died except because of the torture, but they didn't actually kill you, you died in prison or something. We call you they become a martyr. So, but we call him a martyr. Um, even though it wasn't the sword that killed him. It's like our Lord took him almost as a last, you know what, <laughs> to, the, to the executioners, you know, you, you like, you, you think you're in control of the situation. He's literally going to die. I can't think of a, of a, of a, of a, of a non, a, non, you know, a G version of way of saying that, you know, um, you know what, you know, you can shove it, you know, I'm going to, his I'm Lord, our Lord says, I'm going to take it before you can take his life. Um, so that this kind of paradox that works so well within Christianity of, of praying for the body, working for a healthy body, uh, you know, having a body that is able to last 113 years, but also understanding the power of of needing to orient it and this this kind of scraping that he uses, and then the body just you know being taken, <laughs> separation of body and soul before the executioner can even do his job. I just thought it was a pretty cool story of someone who's glowing with joy. Yeah, I um the the um the thing that struck me the most when the story was read um, the other night, uh, we we read the prologue at Vespers because since we pray Vespers every day, that's when the liturgical day starts. So we're already at Vespers singing right. hymns about whoever this saint is. So it's nice to have the context. But um, but if you're only live streaming matins, it makes sense to do it at matins. Um, <clears throat> the, so anyways, what, sh- what struck me when we were reading this the other night is I was like, Father Michael picked two saints who were flayed <laughs> for for my um my choices, and I was like, "That's kind of fun." Nice. And I wonder what that I didn't means. Even think of that? That's funny. So yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna end up getting some like horrible skin disease or something later in life. Mother Natalia, the the unflayed. Mm-hmm. I hope you die peacefully in your bed. No, I kind of hope you die in a martyr, but like. I want you to die an easy martyrdom, not an easy. I want you to die a hard martyrdom, but that's that's that you accomplish well, um, just like me. But I want to go out in like a blaze of glory. 
There is. Um, That's just a selfish way. I, I want to sin when I'm being martyred. I'll stop now and let you talk. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> They, I was just, well, I was actually, I'm looking up because I can't remember, I can't remember the details of it, but do you remember um, in Second Maccabees, the old man who was martyred? Because that's what Carl Lampus makes me think of. It was. I don't, I don't remember the name. Well, it's, it's Eleazar is the name, but I don't remember the story very well. So I was oh. just going to look it up. But anyways, look up Eleazar in Second Maccabees chapter six, um, listeners. And there we go. Um, it's a, it's a similar story, but there's something. Yeah. Oh, that he died before they could kill him? No, he just was an old man like Carl Lampus. Oh. That's what made okay. me. Um, but he also, if I remember correctly, he, um, I don't want to look it up right now because it's just too hard. But um, if I remember correctly, he like gives this beautiful speech too. And there's just something about, um, like we can, that's that's something I love about Carl Lampus too, is as he's, as he's proclaiming this prayer, um, like it's one thing we can preach and we can pray in front of people and we can encourage and we can exhort and we can do all of these things. Um, but the fact that they're doing this, even in the midst of martyrdom, it's, it's a double witness. Like it's not just the witness of their dying for the faith. It's also like, even in yep. the midst of this, I can still tell you these things. That's how firmly convicted they are. Yep. Um, you know, we see this obviously with Saint Stephen too, the proto martyr. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's just really beautiful. Yeah, the, 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 it's similar to the uh, the story of uh, who was the guy Aaron something, Aaron Ralston maybe, the guy who uh, who who was uh, mount who was climbing alone, mm. like mount climbing alone, and he got stuck in a in a cavern and a rock fell on his mm-hmm. arm. And he he was hoping to get saved, like rescued, and this massive rock was on his arm. So, after days, after days of of sitting there, not eating, not drinking, that's when he used his his um, his knife, his pocket knife, to cut his arm off. Like you know, I, I think if I knew that I was going to be found, and sorry, I know if there's children listening, I apologize. <laughs> this would be a very becoming a very violent <laughs> episode. But if there are there are. Uh, like I think if if I knew if I got my arm crushed by a rock, and like and all of a sudden I somehow knew you know no one's gonna find me the, my only chance of survival is to cut my own arm off, um, I think I could do it I actually think I could um, within like you know within the first couple hours but days later when you're hungry and thirsty mm. and exhausted and now you have to put this all this energy and I mean at that point I think I mean you know what Lord just take me now. Like they're going to find a, a skeleton hanging from a rock, you know, in, in in this cavern. But the fact that he had that strength to do that, and I, if you want to listen to another story about this, I'm not going to tell the whole story now. But um, one of the old podcasts I did with Catholic Tub, you should know. Look up the one we called Aaron Planned, E R I N Planned, and I told the story of a of a woman friend of mine, Aaron, who 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 after being exhausted, oh, yeah. eating, sleeping, nothing, was able to kind of push back on a doctor who was who was offering you know a, an abortion and and she was so exhausted and yet still immediately when that was even proposed was able to with immense strength you know tell the doctor no I am willing to suffer and die that my child may live you know you're not you know there's a very little chance you're not going to kill this baby yeah and her her, her own life really was beautiful. at risk in this at the time, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's exactly what it was. And the doctor pretty much said, "Oh, we'll you know we'll we'll remove that baby if your life is at risk." And she said, "No." And and like I think any of us would say that that's that's the Catholic way. But she said it after being exhausted mm-hmm. for a very long time, and it said it very strongly and very quickly. You know, it, it was just like she all of a sudden, like you could see, she was laying in the bed exhausted. And all of a sudden, it just the strength returned to mm-hmm. her with this zeal for the truth and the life of her child, which is beautiful. So, yeah, good point. All right. Uh, next is uh, the second saint of the day is the venerable Prochorus the Oric Eater. So sister named it earlier. Oric is like spinach. Um, just have that in mind. That's how we it's every time I hear it though, I think of the Urukai from Lord of the Rings. I do too. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I just which actually makes it much more makes him much stronger. <laughs> he just killed and ate Oryx. Orcs. Yeah. Because it, it even sounds like orch, yeah. you know, it's O R A C H. All right. Uh, Prochorus was a miracle worker of the monastery of the Kiev Caves. 
He is called the Oric Eater because during the time that he lived in the monastery of the caves, he did not taste bread. Instead, he fed on Oric, mixing it in his own way, and from it he prepared a type of bread. Whenever he would give someone his Oric bread with a blessing, the bread tasted sweet, as though it was prepared from honey. If, however, someone stole the bread, it was as bitter as wormwood. One time, someone stole the bread. Excuse me. One time, when there was a storage, excuse me. One time, when there was a shortage of salt in Russia, Prochorus distributed ashes to the people in place of salt. The ashes that he distributed with the blessing were as salt. However, the ashes that people took on their own remained ordinary ashes. Prince Sviatopolk ordered that all the ashes from Prochorus' cell be taken to his palace with neither the permission nor the blessing of the monk. When the ashes were removed, those who tasted them were convinced that they were ashes and not salt. Then Prochorus told the people who came to him for salt to go to the emperor's palace, and when the prince threw the ashes out of the palace, to take them and carry them home for salt. The people did so, and again the ashes were salt. Having become convinced, the prince himself was filled with respect and love towards the holy man. When Prochorus died in the year 1107 AD, the prince with his own hands placed him in the tomb alongside the great Russian saints, Anthony and Theodosius. So I, I just love that it's such a, I mean, it's such an obvious miracle. Um, I mean, those were always nice. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't have many really, really obvious miracles anymore. We kind of, kind of dig deep, which I think is a beautiful thing. It shows an act of faith, but it's just, it's just really cool that that this man's faith um, was so at the service of the poor, um, especially when there was a shortage, and kind of stuck it to the man, and and just shows, you know, there's a <clears throat> there, there's a, a care that God has for those who cannot care for themselves. Mm. Um, so that the poor were taken care of. It was just, it was a, an act of a holy man and even something like salt, you know, we don't need salt. I mean, salt for preservative can be necessary in, in certain cultures. And that's probably what the necessity was for the poor. But I'm guessing the prince just wanted it because it, you know, it, it added flavor to it. So anyway, I'm, I'm now reading into the story a bit more than I should be probably, yeah. but there's something about, about when we're given gifts, those gifts, are used at the service of others, whether they're miraculous or not, and also the fact that uh, that all he did was was all he did was say this. Mm-hmm. You know, he just he made auric bread and he made, and he and he got ashes. So it's it, it's how you it's how you receive the same thing. It's very similar to a parable, right? In the scriptures, that it's pretty explicit that the parables are 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 life giving to those who approach them looking for life. And they are just simple stories that can be even distracting or off-putting to those who are looking to to criticize the writer of the parables and others to criticize Jesus. So the same parable can have very different. Uh, the same parable can can give very different uh, mindset, whether it's peace or anxiety. Um, can teach about God and yet can also hide or cloud the the inner mysteries of God if the one who's reading the parable intends to use them for for violence or persecution. Mm-hmm. And so it's the same thing. This is just ash, but the same ash tastes like salt to those who approach it having received the blessing and as a gift and it's for those who steal it or want to use it for their own means, it's just ash. So it's the same thing, just perceived two different ways based upon the the acts of the one perceiving it or receiving it. Mm-hmm. It reminds me very much of do you know do you know the story of um Maria Poch? Yes. Okay. So it reminds me <clears throat> very much of the story of Maria Poch because That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, please. And this thought probably I would have never made this connection if I wasn't our monastery is across the street from the shrine of Our Lady of Maria Poch. Um mm-hmm. but the the story is that there's a town in Hungary that was called Poch, Hungary. And um, there was an icon there of the Theotokos, the mother of God, and um, a poor town. So again, it's, it's God's love for the poor, um, which is part of what made me think of it. And the, the icon was a miraculous icon. It was weeping um, and interpreted as, as weeping for the sorrows of of her people, of, of the people of Poach. And, um, 
so obviously this icon was was very revered and then um Leopold the first it's Leopold the first I think um heard about this icon and so he wanted it <laughs> so same story I think I th- okay um I think it might be Stephen but I anyway, mean go okay. ahead um I'll uh maybe you can look it up as I'm telling the story I, I could be okay. wrong yep. um okay. so um, anyways, the emperor takes the the icon. Um, the people are none too happy about this. And then, as far as I can remember, the icon stops weeping at that point. Like it doesn't weep for for the emperor. And then, um, and then later, the bishop um, has a copy of the icon made for the people of Poach. And the copy begins to weep. And so, so the beauty of that for me is like it just makes it all the more clear of like it's not about the material thing just like in the in this story of Prochorus it's not about the ash it's not about um the icon in and of itself it's the manifestation of god in the icon and the mother of god in the icon and that's where the the power is and that's where the miracle is um and god can work that miracle through the copy of the icon just as easily as he could through the original. Um, so the this became um, a place of pilgrimage for people, of course, and then it became so big that the bazillion fathers were sent to take care of the shrine. And ever since then, I think it's been, the town became known as Maria Poach, named after Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is, uh, it is, that that that's very fitting. I can't believe I didn't think of myself because I've I've been the Mighty Poach probably, goodness, five six mm-hmm. times. So I've been I've been very blessed in my travels to, to the to the Eastern Europe to be able to kind of use that as as a waypoint. Oh Did you gosh, find out who I the just, emperor was? I'm literally, I'm literally scrolling through a picture of. By the way, just to talk about modern modern culture, I'm I'm literally looking for the story, and as I'm scrolling, there's a near pornographic picture here on oh an advertisement. Goodness. I'm just like, oh my gosh, come on. I'm, look, um, I'm looking up something. I have it here. It's Emperor Leopold I. All right, you're right. It's St. Wrong. Stephen's Cathedral. Maybe that's why you were thinking. Yes, you're right. Stephen. Yep, it went to St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. Yes. Okay, there we go. Leopold I. Thank mm-hmm. you. So anyways, that's, uh, that's right. just very cool. I feel like it's a similar, yeah, it gives that same message, so... It does. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, I had it happen again um, where I, I preached and like, I, I remember the basic outline of my homily mm-hmm. and somebody came up to me and, and literally said, you know, oh, it's like your homily last Sunday, father. And then told like what they got from it. And I was like, that is, I have first, it took me a, a bit of time to even figure out what they were talking mm-hmm. about. Like it was a beautiful point, <laughs> but it was not for my homily. And then I said, you know, maybe they, maybe they heard this and their brain went there. So it's like, it's the same thing. Like you, you, a homily, a word, a statement to a friend, a, a convicting or comforting word, like these things, you, God does not need you to be eloquent, mm-hmm. right? Paul talks about the time. God does not you, need you to be eloquent. He just needs you to be truthful and desiring holiness and desiring and, and it, speaking these things out of love. Um, and he'll take your words and, and he'll make them beautiful. Mm. You know, this is, St. Paul says this about his eloquence. Um, we hear about the groanings in the spirit. The spirit translates our, our prayers that are so simple um, and makes them worthy of God. You know, there, there's a lot of things like this where we can, we don't need to, as, as you've reminded me, sister, a couple of times that um, I realized when I was a young priest that, that, you know, I pray more after I preach than before mm. I preach. Because there's something, the prayer after I preach reminds me that Lord help help what I said find a fruitful ground, mm-hmm. you know, um, like the parable of the, of the seeds, you know, let it find, because you, you can do, our Lord can do as much after I preach it as before I preach it. You know, he, he doesn't need me to say everything perfectly in order to inspire people to, to desire the kingdom and to become holy. Yeah. 
Um, so we can actually pray and say, Lord, you know, take take my words and, and do something with them that are beautiful. And then that, it also is a very humbling thing because you go, eh, it really doesn't matter what I say, you know, <laughs> I just got to do the best I can and then our Lord's going to do the real work. Yeah, I just read, um, I was reading Little Women again this morning because I only have two more days to <laughs> read it and I need to finish because we don't read, um, we only read spiritual reading during the Great Fast and the Great Fast starts um, on Monday and it's Friday. So anyways, I'm trying to, yeah, finish please. Little Women, which is a very big book, and <laughs> um, there is a there is a line that I really loved this morning. That's um, the father is is reading. Um, I don't remember what he's reading. He's reading scripture, or some sort of spiritual reading, or something. And um, but it says that um, he read very beautifully and whatever. But then he read with the most eloquence in those moments where he faltered over his words, because at this point in the book, um, I don't want to give a huge spoiler at this point in the book, someone is dying. And so someone that he loves very much. And so, um, he's, he's faltering over his words as he reads this. And, and the, the line is that that's, those were the words that were the most eloquent. And I thought that was beautiful because it's like, and, and so reassuring to me because his eloquence was not in his articulation. His eloquence right. was in the feeling with which he, he proclaimed these words. Um, and beautiful. it's like that his, his intonation, his faltering, his getting choked up, like that's what was eloquent. Um, and I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. I know it's cliche and I know I've mentioned this before, but I, it was kind of, it was a striking meme one time I saw. And again, it's, it's very cliche, but I, I like it. Is It just shows um, a picture of like a piece of paper and it just has, shows tears on it and then says, a, then somebody wrote amen. Mm. You know, it's it's like the the tears become the prayer. Mm -hmm. You know that you don't you don't need to be eloquent and write beautiful things. There's a the sincerity of the weeping. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very Byzantine. You use the you use the the tuft of your chotki to to wipe away your tears and the gift of tears and the the weeping for our own sins and the sins of the world. And and there's just something that is very very eloquent about that um, that we can perceive in in ways in the in this world of media. You know, people. We, we try to be inspired by things online and things like that, but you, it's just it, people that are, there's a lot of people that are not eloquent about writing posts and, you know, doing videos and things like that. And, and, you know, it, you, you're going to miss out on their contribution to the kingdom of God. If you don't have those real relationships and let, let, um, kind of let them shine with whatever their light is, you know, that you don't hide under a bushel basket, but, but allow, allow them to speak their eloquence in different ways and, and be inspired or moved by that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. I really like the I really like those saints. We're good. Me too. Me too. All right. Well, my my prayer intention is for I just found out yesterday I was asked to be a godfather again. So this is little god god baby will be god baby number 13 for me. Um so uh I, I would I would list them all right now, but I don't want to give away the name of God Baby number twelve. And the way the way that I've memorized them, the God Baby number twelve is not born yet. Um but when Bob God Baby number twelve is born, then I'll then I'll be able to say the name. I don't want to I, I know I'll say it because I, I memorize all the names I can order. So I won't say them all. But anyway, um if you'll pray for little Gianna is God Baby number thirteen. Mm. Um for her and pray for me too that I become a, a good godfather to uh, little little baby John and and I only met Gianna's parents here in LA. So mm. in other words it's it's the first my first godchild um as part of my new my new ministry Aww. here and relationships I've made here. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well then I will just um I'll piggyback off of that and ask you to pray for Angelo and Angelica, my two godchildren as well. Um mm. but uh, second prayer intention. Um, please pray for one another, just the other listeners, um, as well as just everyone in the world to have a greater um, detachment, particularly to this possessiveness we have over time. I just, um, Sister Petra and I recorded with Pines with Jack, um, last week, this week. Um, but anyways, it'll be released on March 2nd. And I think this episode is coming out March 3rd. So 
Um, so theoretically, it just came out yesterday. But we were talking about um, the the letter from Screw Tape Letters. That's all about possessiveness of time, and it's something that I feel so strongly about. Um, which I, you know, we did our own episode on it um, several weeks ago. Um, whose time is it anyway? I was so proud of that title. Like that was just the cl- the most clever <laughs> yes, thing in the yes, world. Yes, you were. <laughs> 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 um, other people didn't think it was as brilliant as I did, but I'm still really proud of it. Hmm. Anyways, um, but I do think I'm I'm very strongly convicted that that we all just have this great struggle with possessiveness of time, and so pray for one another and and for yourselves to have a greater detachment um, from your time. Amen. And you, you mentioned that another another thing that I'm sure we'll put on social media is I will be um, so we'll 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 put on social media sister. Natalia's and, and Sister Petra's mm-hmm. talk over at, over at Pines with Jack. But um, also uh, on March 23rd, um, I will be doing the Eparchy of Parma's Theology on yeah. Tap over Zoom. So I think, I think so March 23rd is going to be at, um, at 8 p.m. Eastern. Mm-hmm. And I think, the, I think the best way to, is to go on is to, uh, to find, if you're on Facebook, to find the Eparchy of Parma Facebook page. Um, that's at least where I saw it because the first one that happened, the first one was just done. Um, but we'll, we'll try to figure out something else. But I know that not all of you are on social media. Um, so uh, if you just want to maybe Google the Eparchy of Parma, P-A-R-M-A, E-P-A-R-C-H-Y of P-A-R-M-A, Eparchy of Parma, and, and look up Theology on Tap, and then I'll be doing that over Zoom again on uh, March 23rd and talking about Lent and stuff. So I almost, I almost just used you as a sounding board sister to prepare my talk because I have my topic, but sometimes I need to talk it out once before I give it. Mm. Um, so I almost chose that as a topic today, but I didn't want to give it away to anybody who may want to go to the Theology on Tap too, because I, I know that's a big boost for for the eparchy to do that. And I, I I'm just, make sure I'm just watch. really impressed that you're thinking about your talk a month and a half before you're giving it. Well, so so this is this is the 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 maturity of Father Michael O'Loughlin. So, wow. um, and 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 Mother Gabriella knew it. She said, "Do you have any Lenten topics that you already know about yeah. that you want to give a talk on?" And and so I said, "That's a really good point. I don't need to spend more time away from my ministry." Mm-hmm. Um, where's my pectoral cross? I just, anyway, I just I'm like that's my pocket. Okay. Um, so anyway, <laughs> Perla, um, the. Uh, but so I so I thought, well, I don't have like I don't want to do I don't want to repeat a Lenten talk I've given in the past. But there's definitely th- two or three things that have been milling around in my brain mm-hmm. that that I that I'm going to be talking about to my parish, and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna use those things that I'm already kind of I want to think about. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so that's why it's been it's been a lot easier for me. Like I get so stressed out giving talks. You know this. I hate giving talks, but um, the ones that I've been asked to give recently, it hasn't been as bad because I'm just like. I could just talk about something I've talked about on the podcast and then I can incorporate Father yeah, Michael's exactly. comments too. And like, yeah. so it's actually been, <laughs> yeah, so that's been helpful. Nice. I don't think we ever talked that long after giving our prayer intentions. So sorry. This is probably true. <laughs> this is probably true. On Catholic stuff, we would, we would, they, our editor would start the music. Like I want to start a shout outs. And sometimes they had to like loop it over and over and <laughs> so over again because we'd be doing this. Shout out to yeah, Carolina there's... Sheridan because she's coming this weekend. Nice. Are you so excited? Good. Oh, I am. I you, she's gonna love you guys. Her here, her and Paul and and the little ones, their two little ones are gonna love you guys and uh and you're gonna love them. I'm so, so excited to meet them. I would say, well, yeah, so the if you want to earn the love of of Carolina and Paul's children. You have to give them popsicles, but unfortunately, it's going to be the great fast. I know, and you probably well, it's probably not the great fast. It's Sunday, but, but it's right before liturgy. So, if you have two popsicles for after liturgy, that would be hilarious. That's a wait. This really coming Sunday? No. Yeah. No. 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 Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, they're already gone, so they won't be with me. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so get 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 two popsicles, and then afterwards, don't don't tell Carolina that that you know this. Okay. But afterwards, just just walk up with two popsicles and to give to their two kids. You mean like the otter pops, or like what kind of popsicles? Whatever. Okay. What it doesn't matter. What it, I I give I give like Italian ice. Uh-huh. I buy Italian ice every Sunday for the for the kids, okay. and like Italian. But you can give them, and they just they just say popsicles. I mean, literally, their oldest child will run into the sacristy before I get invested, like. 
jump on me and say, popsicles, popsicles, popsicles. <laughs> like he literally, his his mom will not let me give him a popsicle if they come for anything else other than liturgy because I think the popsicles actually keep him well behaved. Okay. <laughs> like the hope of getting a popsicle after liturgy keeps him well behaved. So if you have two popsicles, that will be hilarious okay. and awesome. I'm going to try, one of the nuns is going to the store today, so I'm going to try to make that happen. I'm really sorry to all the listeners who had to just endure all that, but I'm really excited to <laughs> win these kids over with popsicles. Well, Carolina's a listener, so that, that was a that was a pretty epic shout out for her. <laughs> Great. All right. Love you, sister. Love you. Do you want to give a blessing? Love you, listeners. I guess so. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May our Lord bless all of you. May you desire the holiness of the saints. May you always call upon their intercession. May you desire their holiness and their humility. May you desire their steadfastness and their perseverance. May you desire their clarity and their desire for truth. May you desire their love for the poor and their understanding of the place of the body, of the soul, of the spirit. And may you desire their submission to the will of God. And may our Lord send you forth this week and every week um, desirous of his glory, of his kingdom, and of the salvation of your soul. May our Lord bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks. God bless y'all. Love you. Love, Love you, listeners. You.